Good morning and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akiri Duluale, the headlines. Heavy shelling reported near Lviv airport as invasion enters day 23. Australia and Japan impose more sanctions on Russia. And U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping to hold virtual summit over the Russia-Ukraine war. We start with the latest this morning, an airstrike hitting the historic city of Lviv. Uh, that's uh, just the first since the war began more than three weeks ago now. At least three explosions were heard in the western Ukrainian city. Uh, this morning, according to the Ukraine 24 television station, it published a short video in which a mushroom-shaped plume of smoke could be seen rising on the horizon. The mayor of Lviv has clarified that the airport was not hit, but a building next to it was. If confirmed as a Russian missile strike, this is the closest that they have struck Lviv, a border city where many refugees pass to cross into Poland. And Mariupol City Council says rescuers are trying to clear debris at the collapsed drama theater in spite of continuous shelling. Ukraine says more than 3,800 people were evacuated from cities yesterday, including about 2,000 who left the besieged city of Mariupol. Local authorities say the southeastern city of Mariupol remains under heavy assault by Russian forces. Civilians are also said to be emerging alive from the ruins of the theater that, according to Ukrainian authorities, was bombed by Russia in the city. In spite of pictures of devastation at the scene, many who were sheltering there are thought to have survived in a basement that withstood the attack. And Australia and Japan have imposed more sanctions on Russian elite. Canberra added Russian billionaires Oleg Deripaska and Viktor Vexelberg and 11 banks and government entities to its sanctions list. In a statement, the foreign ministry there says the inclusion of the Central Bank of Russia uh, has Australia now targeting all Russian government entities responsible for issuing and managing Russia's sovereign debt. Meanwhile, Tokyo has sanctioned 15 more Russians and nine organizations, including the state-owned arms exporter Rosoboron Export. And staying with Australia, which says it is working in close cooperation with international partners to increase sanctions uh, pressure on oligarchs close to Russian President Vladimir Putin over the invasion of uh, Ukraine. Sanctions on 11 additional Russian banks and government entities and the majority of the country's banking assets are now covered by our sanctions along with all of the entities that handle Russia's sovereign debt. Today's listing includes the Russian National Wealth Fund, the Russian Ministry of Finance. Uh, with our recent inclusion of the Central Bank of Russia, we have now targeted all Russian government entities that are responsible for issuing and managing Russia's sovereign debt. Uh, those additional banks together account for approximately 80% of all banking assets in Russia. This continues our commitment to working very closely with international partners on imposing high costs on Russia, and that does include uh, listing individuals of economic and strategic significance to Russia who have both benefited from and supported the Putin regime. Uh, we have, in addition to the 41 oligarchs and immediate family members on whom we had already placed targeted financial sanctions and travel bans, added two further individuals with links to business interests in Australia, uh, Oleg Deripaska and Victor Vexelberg. Uh, and in doing so, we continue that close cooperation with key international partners. Uh, these are important steps. I take advice from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, on uh, the sanctions process. It has been a very intense process, as you can imagine, in recent weeks, not just here in Australia, uh, for both the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and my own office, but for uh, our similar uh, partner departments and agencies across the world. 
the due diligence that uh, is required to be done in relation to the sanctions process is extensive. Uh, it involves a significant uh, uh, detail and legal uh, issues and uh, once that advice was received from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, I was able to sanction both of those individuals overnight. Foreign Minister in Australia, Maurice uh, Payne. The mayor of the Sumi region in the northeast of Ukraine has posted details about possible humanitarian corridors that could be opened today in the region. Buses and vans would be sent to towns to help transport people. There are six different routes, all of which lead to Poltava in central Ukraine. Sumy, which is close to the Russian border and front line, has experienced heavy shelling with power and water cut off in recent weeks. UN Political Affairs Chief Rosemary DiCalio told the Security Council that more than 700 civilians, including 52 children, have been killed in Ukraine since Russia invaded three weeks ago. But she says the actual number is likely to be much higher. She told the 15-member council that the UN Human Rights Agency has recorded 726 deaths, including that of 52 children, and 1,174 people injured including 63 children between the 24th of February and the 15th of March. The Calio, however, did not specify who was to blame. Speaking to the UN Security Council, uh, the WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus said the organization has verified 43 attacks on healthcare in Ukraine that have killed 12 people and injured dozens more, including health workers. Between 24 February and 15 March, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights recorded 1,900 civilian casualties. The total consists of 726 people killed, including 52 children, and 1,174 injured, including 63 children. The actual number is likely much higher. Most of these casualties were caused by the use in populated areas of explosive weapons with a wide impact area. Hundreds of residential buildings have been damaged or destroyed, as have hospitals and schools. The magnitude of civilian casualties and the destruction of civilian infrastructure in Ukraine cannot be denied. This demands a thorough investigation and accountability. WHO has verified 43 attacks on health care with 12 people killed and 34 injured, including health workers. In any conflict, attacks on health care are a violation of international humanitarian law. They deprive people of urgently needed care and break already restrained health systems. Russia will be held accountable for its atrocities. There's only one way, one way to end this madness. President Putin, stop the killing. Withdraw your forces. Leave Ukraine once and for all. Dr. Mikhail Maciejczyk, head of the Department of Family Medicine in the Polish Mother's Hospital, joins uh, me now on the program uh, from Poland, uh, where, of course, a lot of refugees have gone since this crisis started uh, more than 22 days ago. Nice to have you on the program, Doc. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, sir, and welcome, all you viewers. Let me it's ask nice you, we're, we're, we're moving away now from the battlefront itself, and we're taking a look at mm -hmm. those who have gone into Poland, for example, as refugees and are trying to uh, uh, either find their way uh, to their uh, origin countries or are trying to just get by until this crisis gets over. What can you tell us about their state of health? The situation at that point is that over 2 million people came to Poland as refugees. Uh, the country start to have problems with uh, accepting more. We will do our best to accept everybody. But at that particular moment, uh, we start to have some issues with health system, with accommodation for them. Most of those uh, people stay at homes of, of Polish citizens. 
instance. It's not like um, refugee camps or something like that. Uh, I have two or three people uh, at my place at that time, and most of my friends have somebody as well. So from the point of view of housing, uh, our capabilities are starting to, to block. From the point of view of health system, we are doing all that we can to, to support and to help uh, the refugees. Uh, most of them are children and women, uh, and um, also very, very young children that need not only uh, care that it's immediate, like uh, injuries or sickness, but also vaccinations uh, and that kind of stuff. It's uh, under, the, the Polish system is under big, big pressure now. Uh, extra two million uh, patients is a very big number for us, but we are trying to, to deal with that. The another problem is an issue with the language because uh, only a part of the Ukrainians can speak English or Polish. Some of Polish doctors speak Russian as well, so the communication uh, exists, but uh, we are also fighting to, to find translators for, for the doctors. At that point, um, also there is an issue with vaccinations uh, for COVID, uh, because a major uh, number of the, of the refugees are not vaccinated, and daily rate of COVID in Poland is still over 10,000. For today, it's 11,000. 500, uh, I suppose. So uh, the pandemic is still not uh, gone. Um, so we have two, two problems at the same time. But for now, we are trying to, to uh, deal with, with all that. The uh, issue is for the long term, because even if the war will stop uh, within days or hours, uh, the destruction and the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine is tremendous. Some we can see in the in the footage from from Ukraine, but if you talk to people who actually escaped from there, it's much much worse than than we can see in TV. Some of the cities are completely ruined; nothing stands. So uh, basically, those people don't have a place to go back to, at least at that pro at that moment. So uh, the situation is that we need to prepare uh, for a much longer stay for uh, the refugees and probably for another wave because from the from the night footage we see that the russian army starts to attack uh, western ukraine which was un intact pretty much in past 23 days and today uh, Lvov was um, bombarded and uh, that will mean that all the people that actually escaped from eastern Ukraine to the western border, to the border with Poland, they will try and probably succeed in crossing the border uh, to Poland and we will have um, another group of refugees. Uh, statistics count that probably we need to prepare for at least 4 million people. So uh, we are halfway there and um, from the point of view of healthcare, we have some issues and we will have some issues. The um, good part is that the government is doing everything to put Russian, uh, to, to put uh, Ukrainian uh, doctors into the system as soon as possible, at least to help uh, their own uh, citizens. So, Doctor, uh, uh, let, me, let me interrupt you and ask this, though. Many of the two million people uh, who have made it across to Poland, uh, are, you, are you noticing that uh, many of them are, uh, apart from the fact that they are not vaccinated and they are adding mm -hmm. to the COVID-19 burden that Poland is already carrying, are, yeah. are they coming across uh, with injuries that need to be attended to uh, or are they with ailments such as hypothermia uh, and other such ailments that are caused by extremities of weather and exposure to the elements? Are you noticing any of that? Definitely, definitely yes, but we are noticing a bit less of those problems because we are in center of Poland, so they are getting to us uh, through uh, the different centers um, in the eastern border. So most of the people that need immediate help, uh, it's getting it on the border or uh, in Warsaw and cities closer to, to the border. So we are getting uh, 
people who are exhausted, but most of them mm, not injured uh, because of war and um, they are at least one uh, day in Poland before they are getting to, to, to get help in, in, in my hospital. So uh, not too many injuries, not too many mm, hypothermic problems, but definitely there are that kind of problems. I've been to the border last week uh, just to bring some of my friend uh, family and uh, the situation there is, is uh, very difficult, maybe not critical yet, but if we will get another wave uh, of the same size, we definitely will be uh, under tremendous pressure. The, the other question, of course, then, is that if, as we are seeing from the visuals on the screen there, uh, just before they took it off, uh, if the producers can bring that picture back, you see that uh, there are a lot of people in that visual who are in uh, uh, shelters, who are in camps and, uh, and all of that, in very close proximity, and that spoke to the issue of housing that you raised earlier on. How, how possible is it that so many people arriving within such a short period of time could be accommodating, the, the Poles have been very hospitable, the refugees have said so themselves, and you have confirmed that, but in terms of the pressure on the healthcare system, uh, which was already dealing with COVID before their arrival, and you're saying we should prepare, or you need to prepare for four million. At the rate of the crossover, two million have already crossed over, so, and this is three weeks. Yes. In another three weeks, you will hit four million. And that, there's no indication that in three weeks, this crisis will be over, is there? There is no, absolutely no indication. The crisis won't be over for months. Because again, as I said, even if everything stops now, uh, they don't have places to come back to. Okay, and Ukraine at that pro moment doesn't have uh, either strength, either money to rebuild fast. So uh, the pressure is, you know, Poland is about 38 million people. Uh, and if we are getting 10% more within six weeks, uh, it's impossible for any system to, to, to be fluent in that. We are doing uh, all our best and we have some experience from COVID situations that we can uh, react uh, in a similar way, let's say, that uh, we will get longer shifts, uh, a bit more doctors uh, stays in, in hospitals, that kind of stuff. But that can be done for weeks, not months. Uh, maybe month or two, but later on we need um, either to relocate some of those people, and some of that is happening because they do have families around the Europe, so they are going out of Poland as well but that's uh, maybe 10, maybe 20% of the refugees. But uh, at that particular moment, I think uh, the amount of uh, housing places is almost over. That's why you can start seeing uh, that kind of uh, footage as you are showing now. Because for first like three, uh, for, for, for the first two weeks, 90% uh, of the refugees were actually coming to homes to people. Uh, even don't knowing them, and that's how it worked. That that's why we don't have a humanitarian crisis in Poland now. But uh, for another two million, we need to start uh, finding places uh, that normally are not um, used as as. Uh, staying places. That's what's happening. Some of the um, places that were used for COVID hospitals are transferred to housing places for Ukrainians as well. Uh, but that's a very temporary situation. It can, uh, people can stay at my home or uh, another uh, place uh, for weeks, months. That's possible. But staying in the place that it uh, shows on the, on the footage now for weeks or months is impossible. It's possible for days. And uh, again, um, probably the government is doing everything they can to, to, to change the situation, but nobody can actually uh, create uh, two million uh, places uh, within weeks. 
So uh, the, the good thing is that uh, the winter is going out. So, so at least the temperatures will be uh, over zero. Uh, so that that's answers a bit your question about hypothermia. But still, we need housing. We need uh, we need to um, create a, again a system probably of healthcare for them, because uh, that's uh, again 10 percent of our population. Uh, so we need to to prepare for that and we are trying to do all our best to, 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 to sustain that situation. Dr. Majiacic, uh, Dr. Majiacic, uh, uh, this is a difficult situation. We will be, of course, coming back to you in the days to come uh, to, to cross-check to see how those numbers are rising and how um, Poland is coping. One would, of course, expect that the European Union and other such uh, bodies would step in and uh, uh, assist Poland with resources to be able to cope uh, with this because Poland, uh, of all the countries uh, surrounding Ukraine, uh, has received the most uh, refugees uh, within this period. But I want to thank you for your time uh, this morning. It's, uh, it's not been a pleasure, it's been sad uh, uh, talking to you about yeah. this, but um, one hopes that things will get better. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for the invitation and definitely I can uh, be here again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll take a break, and when we come back, we will have uh, the business side of things. Uh, what is happening to the ruble uh, following yesterday's uh, situation with Russia's death? Please stay on this. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has blamed NATO for the war in Ukraine and says he will resist calls to condemn Russia in comments that cast doubt over whether he would be accepted by Ukraine or the West as a mediator. President Ramaphosa says the war could have been avoided if NATO had heeded the warnings from amongst its own leaders and officials over the years that its eastward expansion would lead to greater, not less, instability in the region. The South African president says rather than take an expected adversarial approach, he wanted to focus on mediation as war was unlikely to lead to a resolution. The war could have been avoided if NATO had heeded the warnings from amongst its own leaders and officials over the years that its eastward expansion would lead to greater, not less, instability in the region. Our position is very clear. And I did say that there are those who are insisting that we should take a very adversarial stance and position against, say, Russia. And the approach that we have chosen to take, which is appreciated by many, is that we are insisting, we are insisting that there should be dialogue. What is happening out there is undesirable. It is not what should be happening between nations. War, violence, never really solves any problems. And it is for this reason that we say we would prefer and we insist that there should be mediation, there should be dialogue, and there should be negotiation. Now, I am pleased to continue hearing, and having heard it from President Putin himself, to continue hearing that the negotiations are ongoing. And, and they are making progress. Now, now for, for us, us, this is an important development. development. Whilst, Whilst other people scream and shout, we, we want, want to focus on the, on the outcome, outcome, the positive outcome of those negotiations, negotiations and that mediation process. That is what is important. Oil prices extended their rally today at the end of a third volatile week of trade after slim progress in peace talks between Russia and Ukraine raised the specter of tighter sanctions and a prolonged disruption to oil supplies. Brent crude futures jumped $2.75 to $109.39 a barrel after surging nearly 9% on Thursday in the largest percentage gain since mid-2020. 
U.S. West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures climbed $2.93 to $105.91 a barrel, adding to an 8% jump uh, yesterday. Well, Ine John McQuar, our business correspondent, joins me to unpack this and other happenings along that line. Hi, Ine. Good morning. So, oil is still yes, very at volatile. the center. Yes, and uh, very, sentiment, very sentimental, we can see there, seeing that because the talk stalled yesterday, that is why we see this hike in, in, in oil prices. Remember yesterday, it had gone to 190. That's WTI right. was about 90, you know, but because uh, the talk doesn't look like it's having uh, a headway, yesterday's talk that's why we see this so it's really sensitive and sometimes we ask is it the fundamentals that are driving the prices or is it just investor sentiment you know because if we say because it, the, the talk stalled and then we and then we see this it hasn't changed the demand it hasn't changed the supply yes we do have covid in china but i mean it didn't just happen it's been on since i think for last yes, week you I, know so how can we explain this movement but basically it's investor sentiment and reaction to to the talks obviously w would you say that is also the reason i mean investor sentiment why contrary to possibly all calculations the ruble is strengthening uh <laughs> I, I i i had to read this the story twice to be sure <laughs> to that, be I, sure. that i was getting the yes, point because it went from about 133 that we the last time we talked about it to that's about 102 right. but no that's not it so what happened is in russia uh, you know most currencies are controlled nigeria's own is semi-controlled right. you know we, they don't just leave the currency to um the factors of demand and supply in China, it is highly controlled. In Russia, it is also controlled. So what the government did on Monday, they did announce that they were going to change the exchange rates. So the measurements, the way they measure it. So they, they just announced it on Monday. They didn't say when it will come into enforcement. So most likely, it has come into enforcement. And that's why we see it strengthening, uh, you know, for that. Uh, be just between uh, Monday and today, it's gone from 133 uh, to a dollar to 102. So most likely, that new calculation rate has been enforced that is why we are seeing that is what, that that's what's because this. I mean the sanctions are still there I mean, and they're biting and they're biting and President Putin has come out to say they are actually biting and actually asking for how to boost welfare uh, packages to people because of what is going on in the country so the, the robot hasn't added value it's just, okay, so I, I, it's I just wasn't completely wrong when I was checking it <laughs> no you were not okay now the impact of the war on India India has been fairly outside the conversation here hmm. uh, and but india has the second highest population in the world yes. after china india, india is playing really smart here but we hope it doesn't come back to bite them so what india has been doing is buying you know a lot of countries and corporates have a uh, halted sale and imports of russian oil they've been buying it they've been buying it at 20 percent lower in fact according to their minister they say uh, well somebody has to buy it you know so they are doing because they have a special relationship uh what do they call they call the relationship they have with russia special and privileged strategic partnership that's what they call it so they've been buying oil from russia and in fact uh, and they've been buying it not through the dollar you know they would have had to use the dollar since it's international right. but they've been buying it through a special payment arrangement that russia has with china is the ruble one uh, uh payment system okay. that's what they've been using to buy that and of course that boycott or bypasses the sanctions. Exactly, that bycuts all of that. And furthermore, they are trying to even arrange the rupee robo arrangement oh. so that it will even be much better. But they, I mean, you, you can be sure. So far, they, they've had a, a slam from JP Morgan. JP Morgan is an investment uh, bank in, right. in the US. They've they downgraded them. So that means they are also getting a bit of sanction. It's coming there, but U.S. and U.K. are telling them that you know they do a lot of export to the U.S. Right. Even though they have heavy um, imports from Russia and export, they export pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceuticals to Russia. You know, of course, it's the mainstay of the country. You know, so they are actually in a tight corner. Should they forego the relationship they have with Russia, or 
they have also have a very tight uh, uh, trade relationship with U.S. and U.K. Because U.S. and U.K. are warning them that if this continues, then the sanctions might be coming. For, I mean, remember what happened to China's market? Absolutely. Just by uh, the sentiment that they're going to help Russia. You know, so without them actually having said so. without them even having to say that. So not to mention India that is already buying oil from Russia uh, because it's discounted and they are keeping their relationship and all that. We don't know what could happen if, if the West decides to come their way. The OECD, of course, is a club of uh, rich countries yeah. and mostly Western, if not all Western countries. And uh, there, there's been talk about the impact of this war on the global economy, not yeah. just Russia now, yes. not India, not yes. China, but no. the global economy. Yeah, well, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development have said that, in fact, they've, uh, the expectation, you know, normally at the beginning of the year, they have a forecast for growth. But uh, the reality is that whether in Russia or outside Russia, in the West, or in Africa, that forecast has been downgraded because of what's going on. Inflation is high now. Uh, UK released theirs yesterday. US released theirs like two days ago. It's high. Uh, that's interest rate. Right. And it's all to mop up inflation. In Nigeria, we know what's going on, you know, when you talk about inflation. And of course, that erodes the value of currency and living standard. So they are warning the world to get set that it might be a tough one if this war continues because the growth forecast has been downgraded. Uh, this competing with, uh, you know, when we had to deal with uh, COVID. Absolutely. You know, COVID also reduced the forecast growth and all that. So that's what they're saying. So it's, it's not There's a lot to unpack here um, in a Thank you so much, as always, uh, uh, for your analysis. Uh, there will be more details, as we, as we always say, of all of this uh, in the business uh, programs of the day. Uh, Ladi Williams will be here uh, at uh, 10, and Ini herself will be here at 1.30 in the afternoon to unpack this and other developments uh, as they affect uh, business uh, from uh, the war in Ukraine. Thank you, Ini. Thank you for having me. U.S. President Joe Biden is expected to warn Chinese President Xi Jinping against supporting Russia during their phone call later on today. Mr. Biden says that he believes the war in Ukraine represents a genuine struggle between autocracy and democracy and that Mr. Xi Jinping does not believe democracies can be sustained in the 21st century. The two men are expected to discuss China's stance on Russia's invasion in a phone call. Uh, so far, the U.S. has said that China has a responsibility to, quote, use its influence on President Putin to defend international rules and principles. American officials think uh, Xi is one of the few world leaders who might carry some influence with Mr. Putin. But he has so far refused to condemn Russia's aggression and America is very concerned that China might help Russia with military equipment to use in Ukraine. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has accused Germany of putting its economy before his country's security in the run-up to the Russian invasion in an address to the German parliament. Mr. Zelensky criticized the German government's prior support for the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project meant to bring natural gas from Russia in his speech. The president had said Moscow had used Europe to finance the invasion and the sanctions since imposed were not enough to stop it. Ukraine and others had opposed Nord Stream 2, while Berlin, which Berlin has currently halted, warning that it endangered Ukrainian and European security. Heavy black smoke billowed over the city of Kharkiv after Russian missiles hit new targets. A street market in Moskovsky province, western part of Kharkiv, was on fire after being hit. There were no reports of casualties. The market has been closed since the start of the war. The heavy bombardment has destroyed buildings, killed hundreds of people, and forced thousands more uh, to flee their homes. The U.S. House of Representatives overwhelmingly backed legislation to remove most favored nation trade status for Russia and Belarus over the invasion of Ukraine, paving the way for higher tariffs on imports from those countries. The Democrat-controlled House voted 424 to 8 in favor of removing the permanent normal trade relations PNTR status, the latest congressional efforts to put economic pressure on uh, Moscow. To become law, the measure must also pass the Senate. 
The Senate Democratic Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says it would move through the Senate quickly after approval by the House. The move to revoke Russia's status at the World Trade Organization is also being coordinated with similar efforts by other G7 democracies. It would automatically raise U.S. tariffs to non-WTO rates for imports from Russia, and it authorizes U.S. President Joe Biden to proclaim higher tariffs uh, on products from both Russia and uh, Belarus. Um, I rise in support of the suspended normal trade relations with Russia and Belarus Act. And it's very important to highlight here that we do include Belarus in this act. Unfortunately, under leadership of President Lukashenko, Belarus allowed Russians to place ballistic rockets and shell fellow Slavs, Orthodox Christians in Ukraine for weeks. People of Belarus need to understand that their leader is part of what is happening in this genocide in Ukraine. And we cannot create a loophole where Putin is going to use Belarus to funnel money through them. That is a very important legislation also to send a message to Putin and his allies that the West is serious. It's not a temporary thing. They cannot just go kill a bunch of people, destroy cities, kill women and children, and then go back and have business as usual. We're taking a look at some sports, as we always do. London-based equity firm Ethel Partners have become the latest bidder for Chelsea, submitting an offer in excess of £2 billion. According to sources, the proposal includes an immediate £50 million investment to guard against the club becoming insolvent as it continues to operate under a strict license following the UK government's decision to sanction its owner, Roman Abramovich, over his alleged ties to Russian President Vladimir Putin. The New York-based merchant bank Arrain Group, appointed to manage the sale, have set a deadline of 9 p.m. today for the final submission of bids. The UK government will need to grant a license to allow a sale of Chelsea to be completed, but the Department of Culture, Media and Sport have indicated they will likely approve any such applications once the preferred bidder has been identified. Well, let's take a slightly more detailed look now at the issues that have arisen with Chelsea and uh, the bringing of politics into sports, particularly as it relates uh, to this uh, war in uh, Ukraine. I'm being joined uh, by veteran sports commentator Yomi Kuku. Yomi, nice to see you. A lot is good to be here. Now I'm a veteran, really. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All your hair is white. Oh, okay. That makes me a good veteran. Really. Good. Uh, I, I, I want to start with the comment you ended with the last time we spoke yeah. about this, which is that a bad precedent is being set. Absolutely. Uh, with the introduction of what you'd call politics mm -hmm. into sports. Exactly. At that time, it was the Paralympics uh, and the expulsion of the Russians and the Belarusians. And now we're talking Chelsea, mm -hmm. uh, which is being put up for what some have called a fire, a fire sale, mm -hmm. which was completely unnecessary. Very, very unnecessary. Um, First and foremost, I need to uh, make it very clear. No sensible person should like a war. Uh, no sensible person should support violence. And no man with red blood cells running in his uh, body should, you know, support whatever is going on in Ukraine. But the fundamental thing, which I'll, maybe you uh, permit me to digress a bit, was said by uh, the South African president. Why is everybody thinking just one way? Why are we not looking at allowing other people to also have a fair idea of making propositions about finding a mediation platform for this? Why is everybody so concerned about Ukraine and Russia? It's because of the nuclear harmed, you know, uh, that they've got arsenal, that they've got both nations. But now when you look at it, basically, everything the allied countries or forces or NATO countries you're, you're, we're talking about that they have alleged Putin of being exactly what they're doing now. If you dissent now, you're more like a pariah. Uh, the other day we saw online the way they came at, um, you know, some Chelsea players like Frank Lampard. He was giving just a basic media conference and then the Russian thing came in. 
And like, what's your relationship with Roman Abramovich? So now it's a crime for me to even take a selfie with Ladi in case you do something that is wrong with channels now. So I'm like kind of culpable. When did the standard become that as a way of operating with people? They're going just out of the way to show what um, uh, Fela talked about, this, the uprising, bringing out the inhumanity in everyone. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Nobody is looking at what Russia is saying. Nobody is looking at the everyday Ukrainian who are innocent of all these bickerings and the politics. Nobody is looking at the Chelsea players who are going to be affected, the businesses. Okay, some years back you were saying Roman Abramovich brought in some monies from the mob or whatever. But you collected the monies. And now you've got a problem with Russia, so you must collect all his resources back. And you're still allowing other nationals to come and invest in your club football. I don't know if any sensible person will still do that, knowing that I'm a Nigerian, for instance, I've got multi-billion pounds, and then I want to invest my money. And I look around and I say, oh, what they've done to Roman Abramovich, they're still likely going to do to us in case Nigeria is having an issue with the UK or with the US or any of those. You're setting a bad precedent. People have lost their minds completely on this issue. And it's either you are condemning Russia, and they say, oh, you're part of us, you are humane. Or you're saying, no, I don't see it that way. And they say, oh, you are inhumane. Who creates the standard? Who is telling us how to behave? And you telling us how to behave, what have you done in the past? The records are there. We're seeing it. And then you go, coin some words, council culture, what about it? All those things are meant to impugn on the integrity of critical thinking, which has been the hallmark of a civil society, which they are already abandoning. And nobody is telling them. And people say, oh, you have to be careful what you say. What am I going to be careful for? I drove my, myself all the way down here. Who tells you? It's a privilege to be here. It is. Every minute counts because yes, it's a indeed. privilege. That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know I mean? We'll take a, a short break uh, at this point. We'll be back uh, because I still want to ask you, I, I, I want to zero in on Chelsea because there are other things involved. You mentioned them very briefly when you talked about businesses. There are very many businesses associated with football clubs that nobody is mentioning mm -hmm. and who will be affected by mm -hmm. this. We'll talk about that after this break. All right, thanks for staying tuned. We're back uh, and we're talking uh, Chelsea and the sanctions against it uh, with uh, Yomi Kuku, who is here in the studio. Yomi, uh, before the break, we were talking about um, the associated business. I know you mentioned the players, for example, mm -hmm. but there are also other businesses that are directly related. Mm -hmm. uh, and targeting Roman Abramovich may look good in the headlines and yeah. all of that, but all these other people who have nothing to do with Russia or Ukraine Absolutely. or the sanctions will be affected. affected. Yeah, definitely. Uh, like uh, some of the TV contracts they have with other countries, many countries, like, uh, for instance, like in China, they're censoring most of the programs coming in from the Premier League, you know, putting up certain things, like even the colors of, national colors of Ukraine uh, on the, on the, on the uh, programming. And also, we look at the point from the point that uh, Russians also who were supporting Chelsea, they're likely going to be feeling like they're targeting them as well. So it's going to be some drop in revenues for them. Then some players are also going to likely leave. Not all the players support what is happening. And some feel that there should be a mediation point. And they're likely going to be like, okay, you're targeting just Chelsea. And many others would now start looking at it from the point that, do I have to sign for a team that has a foreign backing? You have the stock also rising, going up and down. And basically, now limiting the opportunities for Chelsea to be able to sign players, to be able to give them their deals and all that. Yeah, they say the salaries are going on. 28 million pounds spent every month for salaries and operational costs and all that. Now, these monies were given by Roman Abramovich. So where are they going to be raising the monies? You have some players who are supposed to have signed up their contracts, right. uh, renegotiations and all that renewal. Definitely, they're going to leave. They don't want to stay in a team where you stand and somebody's asking you, you took a picture with Roman Abramovich. That's, that's a sin. And you have to say, okay, I've repented. Nobody wants to do that because they're basically coercing everybody, intimidating everyone, and making sure that to say that, you either say it, we gaggle you, or you don't say it. It's only extremely few people who are like having the courage to tell them. And see, again, they've gone as much as also letting people know that investing in UK business is risky. They've proven it. You don't have to say it. 
Now all the Saudi money is coming into Newcastle. They know the day they have a problem with Saudi Arabia regarding human rights. For now, they don't have because they need oil. The oil price is going up and up. The British Prime Minister was in Saudi Arabia. He was talking about oil. And yeah. he came out and pretend, oh, we talked about human rights as well. The day they were done with Saudi Arabia, then they're going to come at it. So all these other people are going to be holding back their monies. And when they hold back their monies, it means investments in, sport, in football will shrink. And once it shrinks, the opportunities that, in, I mean, uh, widens the, uh, the business sphere will begin to shrink as well. Because people will begin to see like, okay, sports is no longer neutral. It's not politics, so anything can happen. Everybody begins to move and say, I go into my normal proper business and then do my thing and then go my way. So now the precedent they're setting is bad for sports business, is bad for sports administration, is bad for everything that sports has always been for, which is the Olympic truce, neutrality, getting athletes to understand that they could be of different color, they could be of different language, religion, whatever they believe in, but it's still one people doing the same thing. And, you know, Looking at the Olympic Games, uh, the last one, the Paralympics in Beijing, and then yes, seeing that was Russian athletes. I was athletes. going to ask you about next. Yeah. yeah. The Russian athlete and the Ukrainian athletes. Like, you know. That's them in the visuals returning back with, ah. with nothing and without participating. And that's not fair. I can tell you, most of these Russian athletes you've seen, a lot of them don't support Putin. They also suffer. Uh, I mean, from everything going on in Russia, because you can't speak. Who wants to live in a society where you cannot speak your mind? Nobody wants. And then you're now punishing them. That is collective punishment. The same thing you have accused other people of doing. And I want to, I want to seize this opportunity. I hope maybe one or two people, you know, like stray into this, um, our argument. And look at what uh, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa is saying. That we need to look at mediation. That is the next step. Everybody's supplying Ukraine weapons. Everybody's supplying Russia weapons. They're the ones escalating this. This thing could have been avoided. We all know what it's all about. It's about NATO expansion. We should not be pretending. It's about somebody feeling insecure. It's about you not taking the same thing you're giving to someone else. And if they are expressing those fears, don't throw normal people, innocent Ukrainians, into troubles. Innocent uh, Russians who have invested money in every. Maybe the, the very day that Russia uh, invaded Ukraine, there were some Russians who were planning to go to Kiev to Kharkiv, to go and do business. They have invested millions or hundreds of rubles or whatever today. That's a loss. They're not thinking about the larger society. And this is the problem with the political class globally. They just want to continue to maintain their hegemony and dictate to people. And listen, we're just going out of a pandemic. The whole world is in distress. You don't even want to allow even a Putin and just indulge him for a few minutes or a few years and we get over this. This is immoral. This is the point I'm trying to make. It's not that I'm saying I'm anti-US or anti-Russia. I don't have any business with them. Anyway, for me, from day one, I'm a non-aligned person. If we add the non-aligned movement as we speak, maybe Ukraine will be part of it and they won't be in this trouble because you have to make a choice to be with the uh, capitalist or, I mean, the communist or the capitalist because that was the ideology then. Right. But what we're seeing right now is that just two superpowers, not even based on ideology because Russia is already a capitalist nation and America is. So what are we fighting over? It's the privacy of two people. It's a proxy war Ukraine has found itself. And it's very unfortunate. Now, that quite a number of people have said that. Yeah, it's a proxy war. Because again, they're fighting in Ukraine and everything is now decided in the US Congress. What is going on? Now everywhere, even in Nigeria, we can't even buy diesel. We can't buy fuel. Everything is going up. You're putting the old world under distress. And then the Ukrainian president keeps saying one thing. It is World War III. It is World War III. Because Ukraine is fighting Russia, so everybody must go down. I personally do not agree with this. Even if you put a gun to my head, I'll repeat it. I don't agree to this. All right, then, uh, Yomi, uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want to thank you very much. There'll be, of course, other sporting issues. Uh, we'll, we'll be back to talk about this sale when eventually it goes through. Right now, I, I understand the bids are closing at uh, 9 o'clock tonight. Somebody else's money, right? Exactly. And, and most of these are outsiders, and actually. Know, ex exa exactly. So the That's lesson the from what you said... Maybe it's not being learned yet. Stay in your country and invest your money and energy in your economy and stay right there. They call it nationalism, but Chinese people learn from that. And that is what has helped them. They will tell you it's a global village. It is not. And we have seen it. It's not a global village. You can go after some people because exactly. the system is skewed. Yeah. Thank and you double very standard much, comes in And that is it. Thank you very much, Yomi. As always, uh, analysis, a lot of food for thought. Thank you so much for being it's with us. It's a pleasure to be here.
Ukrainian player, that's still talking sports, Andrei Yamolenko was again the hero for West Ham as his extra time goal knocked out Sevilla and sent the Hammers into the European League quarterfinals after a 2-0 victory uh, on the night and 2-1 on aggregate. He gave his shirt to a fan with the Ukraine flag as he celebrated the win. It was Yamolenko's second goal in as many games for West Ham since his return from compassionate leave following the start of the war in his native Ukraine. The Ukrainian now has uh, 13 UEFA uh, Europa League goals, the second most of any uh, Ukrainian player. Yamalenko had been granted compassionate leave after Russia's invasion of Ukraine and missed West Ham's 1-0 loss in the first leg uh, in Spain due to illness. An actor and former governor of California in the United States, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, said that uh, he wanted to, quote, tell the truth about the war in Ukraine to the Russian people. Mr. Schwarzenegger uh, in the video says uh, that it is a humanitarian crisis and because of its brutality, Russia is now isolated from the society of nations. Ukraine and Russia are talking peace talks, uh, but a very big gap remains between both sides. And thank you for sharing your time with me. I'm sending this message through various different channels to reach my dear Russian friends and the Russian soldiers serving in Ukraine. I'm speaking to you today because there are things that are going on in the world that are being kept from you, terrible things that you should know about. The strength and the heart of the Russian people have always inspired me. And that is why I hope that you will let me tell you the truth about the war in Ukraine and what is happening there. No one likes to hear something critical of the government. I understand that. But as a longtime friend of the Russian people, I hope that you will hear what I have to say. It is a humanitarian crisis. Because of its brutality, Russia is now isolated from the society of nations. You're also not being told the truth about the consequences of this war on Russia itself. I regret to tell you that thousands of Russian soldiers that have been killed. Well, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a United States, born, uh, uh, a United States actor and politician there. Uh, talking in a video to the Ukrainian uh, and Russian uh, people. And it's on that note that we'll be ending the program this morning. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ladi Akiri Dulwale. There'll be another update at 5 o'clock in the evening with uh, Amarachi Ubani and Millicent Walker. But between now and then, you have yourselves a good day ahead.